Hello, good evening everybody and welcome to tonight's COVID-19 Knowledge Refresher Update brought to you by the Health Education England Supported Return to Training team. Thank you everybody for giving up your Friday evening uh, to join us tonight. My name is Amy Manicom. I'm a Trainee and Proven Fellow at Health Education England in Thames Valley working on the support programme and I'm also an Anaesthetic Registrar in Oxford. And on behalf of everyone on the panel here tonight, I would like to welcome you to the event. With the current escalating number of COVID-19 cases across the country, many doctors are facing redeployment uh, to areas of, un well, unfamiliar clinical areas, and also um, are returning to clinical practice after time away. So this webinar has been put together in an effort to provide a knowledge refresher update to those doctors who find themselves in the, um, in the face of managing COVID-19 patients. I'm very grateful to be joined tonight on the panel by four experts in their field who are going to be talking to you about the management of patients with COVID-19 and also how to protect yourself and those around you from infection as well. This webinar actually forms part of a series which was started during the first wave of the pandemic in March last year. Um, it's a series of knowledge refresher update uh, webinars which are available on the HEU website and we will post a link to that in the chat. So please do have a browse through those webinars and see if there are any others that um, would be of interest to you. Before we get started uh, tonight, I just wanted to start with a little bit of housekeeping. So all participants, microphones and cameras are switched off during the event. So please feel free to join us from noisy environments or to log in and out of the webinar as you need to. The webinar will be recorded and a recording will be available on the HE website within about seven to 10 days if you just allow a small amount of time for editing to take place. If you do have any questions during the event, please do pop them into the Q&A tab and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, I'm, in the interest of time, I'm going to leave the questions to the end for a panel discussion and we'll try to address as many of them as we can. Um, otherwise, the presenters will also be able to type answers to some of the questions that you have. At the end of the webinar, when you close your tab, down, a feedback survey will appear. Please do take a minute or two to fill in the feedback. It's really helpful for us and it um, will help us in planning future webinars as well. So without uh, further delay, I'm now going to welcome our first speaker for the evening, Dr. Andrew McCallum. Andrew is a consultant in infectious diseases and acute general medicine at Oxford University Hospitals. Prior to August, um, he was working in West London and he spent much of last year managing patients with coronavirus, both at the front door and on the general wards. And um, he's very kindly going to join us tonight to talk about or give, a, give us an update on the current management of COVID-19. So welcome, Andrew. Let me see if I can work this. Do you see my screen okay? Yes, that's perfect. Brilliant. Okay, so many thanks for the invitation to speak. I'm really very impressed to see quite so many attendees on a Friday evening. Um, my name is Andrew McCallum. I'm a consultant in infection and general medicine at Oxford University Hospitals. I'd like to really give you a brief overview of the current coronavirus epidemiology, but really focus more on management at the front door and on general medical wards. And I know that many of you will have first of all, been to many coronavirus presentations and had quite extensive experience from wave one, but I hope this will be a useful refresher for current management recommendations. Okay, I don't know if my slide is moving forward. There we are. So I'd just like to discuss a little bit about the epidemiology and the new variants, a brief refresher on pathophysiology and then COVID at the front door and approach to treatment. I apologise, but I won't be covering level two or three care. This was really outside of my experience. I'll try and stay away from immunology and paediatrics and long COVID as well. So I know that many of us have been watching the graphs for months now, but I first really gave a presentation about coronavirus in early February last year. And on this date in 2020, January the 15th, we only had a second fatality associated with the novel coronavirus being reported. And by early February, we'd had nine cases reported in the UK, and the risk level was about low to moderate at that stage. 
So clearly, well over a year into this now, the situation has changed enormously since then. At recent estimates, we've got actually over 2 million deaths recorded now, more than 90 million cases globally. And you can see that this rate is rising as well. So back in April, it took about six weeks for cases to go up from 10 to 20 million. And more recently, it took about two weeks to go from 80 to 90 million. So early on in the pandemic, I used to keep a close eye on the Johns Hopkins dashboard when the Diamond Princess cruise ship was up near the top of the leaderboard. But really now it's the US, Europe, and to a lesser extent, Brazil, India, Russia at the top of this leaderboard now with the number of cases rising. And the Our World in Data website really provides some excellent figures to keep an idea of what's going on with this uh, pandemic. Unfortunately, the UK is really one of the leaders in new confirmed cases per million, closely followed by the US. With the eye of faith, hopefully we're starting to see a downturn um, over the last few days with the lockdown. And this rise in number of cases is really being felt in terms of the number of inpatients. So we now have more than 35,000 inpatients and rising, which is considerably higher in wave one. And it's a key reason so many are being redeployed at the moment. And ultimately, these peaks in admissions translate into excess mortality. So this data will lag behind many of our other metrics. But what you can see is in wave one, you saw a near doubling of our mortality in England and Wales, shown here in purple. And it's really just starting to rise again now. And then looking at seven day rates per 100,000 population across the UK's upper tier local authorities, you can see that the highest rates are really being seen across the east of England and east London. Really large swathes of the country are now struggling. And certainly we've seen a change in our hospitals from about 80 inpatients before Christmas. We've now got more than, well, roughly 300, more than double that we, what we saw in wave one. So there's several factors that are feeding into this change in the epidemiology, the relaxation of restrictions, more inside living during winter, Christmas, it's really been accelerated by the spread of new variants of coronavirus. And I'm really talking here about the B117 B1, variant in the UK. And we do expect new variants to emerge over time. And the UK has really been a leader in sequencing isolates. So variants of concern, or VOCs, are variants of SARS-CoV-2 that are concerning epidemiological, immunological, or pathogenic properties. So this new variant was first identified in the UK in September. By early January, it accounted for around 6,000 cases on routine genomic testing. So the actual amount is probably much higher. And certainly it was accounting for a sizable fraction of sequence strain, particularly in London and the Southeast in early January. But whole genome sequencing is really only carried out on a minority of samples. And looking at spike gene mutations in the VOC in the variant of concern will cause what we call S gene target failure on the PCR testing in the Lighthouse Labs. So if you have this S gene target failure, that can be used as a proxy indicator for this carriage of this variant of concern. And generally what we're seeing is that an increasing proportion of cases are likely due to this new variant, and that's seen across the country. And early data is really suggesting that this variant is more transmissible. So looking at earlier wild type strains of SARS-CoV-2, around 11% of cases, of contacts of cases, will become cases themselves. With this variant of concern, it's about 14.7%. So this increases about 10 to 70% across most age groups and in most regions where sufficient sequencing data is available. Both the UK, the South African, the Brazilian strains may be associated with greater transmissibility, but to date, there's not really great evidence for increased disease severity. And certainly the UK strain is not expected to affect vaccine efficacy. And while the South African variant may have additional spike protein mutations, while that could theoretically lead to vaccine escape, certainly early work with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine suggests that is not the case. So pathophysiology in brief. So SARS-CoV-2 is a single-stranded RNA virus. It has a spike protein that's knobbly a bit on the outside of the virus, 
that binds to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor that's present on the cell surface. And that's really the target, the spike protein is really the target for vaccine development. So these ACE2 receptors are present in many, many cells, but principally expressed in the airway epithelial cells and in vascular endothelial cells. But we are finding it in olfactory epithelium, so that may account for some of the anosmia features of coronavirus infection. Also enterocytes of the small intestine, arterial and venous endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells in many organs. But in binding to its receptor, the virus will fuse with the membrane, release its genome, and then replicate leading to viral assembly, maturation, and release of further viral particles. And probably as a consequence of this broad receptor availability, SARS-CoV-2 has the ability to cause multi-organ injury. And that may be in part also due to microthrombotic complications. So typically on the general wards, what we're seeing are the respiratory and to less of a sense, vascular complications such as PE. But I've certainly seen presentations with chest pain and myocarditis at the front door. And partly this multi-organ involvement may be important as for the pathophysiology of long COVID. So I'm sure we're all very familiar with the clinical manifestations of this disease by now, with mild disease presenting with flu-like symptoms, moderate disease, more respiratory, lower respiratory tract symptoms such as dyspnea, and severe disease presenting with hypoxia, so SATs less than 94% with classic radiological findings. This one we move on to critical disease with respiratory failure, septic shock, or multi-organ failure. As mentioned, other organs may be involved, the GI tract, renal tract, um, skin, brain, and there may be thrombotic complications that we're seeing as well. So the ISERIC dataset looked at 20,000 odd patients in hospital with coronavirus during the first wave and captured many of the ways that COVID will present. So certainly cough, fever, shortness of breath are common symptoms in this cohort. But we are seeing cutaneous manifestations, abdominal pain, diarrhea, other features um, in these patients early in the pandemic. And of course, there are many comorbidities associated with presenting to hospital with coronavirus particularly cardiac disease, diabetes, and lung disease. And there are many, of, uh, many variations of the schematic out there, but I think it's quite a helpful way to look at the disease. And some important features are, first of all, there is a pre-symptomatic but infectious phase where the highest viral loads are typically seen. So you see that just here, and that's what makes early social distancing, masks, important pillars of public health messaging. So after the initial exposure to the virus, patients will typically develop symptoms within five to six days. And then patients with mild infection, usually their innate, their host of immune response is capable of controlling the infection and leading to recovery within a week or so. Whereas in severe disease, there's an excessive immune response leading to organ damage, intensive care admission, and potentially death. And that can be quite a rapid deterioration in that second stage. The viral load tends to peak relatively early in the, the infection, so usually within the first week, declines gradually thereafter. You start to get detectable antibodies, usually by day 14. So looking at coronavirus and how you manage it at the front door, think about what information is quite helpful when you're admitting the patients to hospital. So certainly when did your symptoms start? And we're often thinking about cough, fever, loss of smell, loss of taste. But as we mentioned, there are many other presentations that may be possible. Try and gather when the first positive swab was, and that's quite helpful for trying to work out isolation advice, certainly for patients going home or for their relatives. And of course, IPC measures are slightly different in the hospital, and I'll touch on that slightly later on. It's useful to get a feel about their comorbidities and assess their clinical frailty score, and if appropriate, Find out about advanced directives, lasting power of attorney for health. Do they have any particular wishes in terms of CPR and have that been discussed with their GP beforehand? It's useful to get an idea about the home situation and who the next of kin is. So the clinical frailty score, it's an aid to decision making in uh, regarding ceilings of care for these patients coming through the front door. I'm sure many of you have seen this illustration and you can get it easily on the internet, 
but usually a cutoff of a frailty score of five is used to delineate increasing frailty. So as patients become increasingly frail, they are understandably less likely to survive COVID infection. And furthermore, increasing frailty score is associated with longer time spent in hospital. And in general, outcomes were worsening with increasing frailty with similar findings after adjustment for both age and comorbidity. And the NICE guidelines have suggested that the clinical frailty score can feed into decision-making for the over 65s. So generally, if you've got a patient that is more frail, so here they're using a cutoff of five, you probably want to have an early decision about whether critical care will be appropriate or not. And that can help determine whether palliation or critical care is appropriate in the event of further deterioration once they're on the ward. And of course, these are not straightforward decisions. So Warwick Medical School has created a tool that can aid in this decision-making regarding escalation. So importantly, what you're trying to do is just build evidence so is this an acute deterioration? Is the patient likely to recover? Do they have the physiological reserve to get better? And what would they have wanted? So a lot of the hospitals that you'll be working in, there may be a COVID care set of standard bloods that you do on admission. And generally it's, it's mostly routine blood, so full blood count, UNEs, LFT, LFTs and CRP. But D-dimer is also particularly helpful. Troponin, blood cultures can be quite useful in this setting as well. You're obviously going to want to get a, a PCR swab. Some hospitals will be using other methods of testing at the front door, such as DNA nudge, or lateral flow devices. And this is often to help guide patient flow through the hospital. Typically for patients admitted, you'll be looking at chest x-ray, which I'll come on to in just a moment. Focus on their saturations and their respiratory rates. The examination, Typical findings are dry bilateral crepitations in the patients you see. I'm sure these um, recommendations may have been upgraded, but generally in looking at chest x-rays, mild appears more black than white and severe more white than black. And classic COVID is defined as really lower lobe peripheral opacities, typically bilaterally. The question about CTPAs in these patients is challenging. So many of your patients will have a raised D-dimer. Many of them will be hypoxic. The British Society of Thoracic Imaging has made some recommendations to try and reduce the use of CTPAs, but it is a difficult clinical diagnosis to make. And I've typically got quite a low threshold for requesting a CTPA given the prevalence of PE in this population. And generally, cross-sectional imaging, what you're seeing are ground glasses, glass opacifications, particularly early in the disease, progressing more onto consolidation later on into the infection. So after your assessment, you're probably going to end up with three diagnoses, either confirmed COVID-19 where they're swab positive, probable COVID-19 or COVID-19 syndrome, where they have a compatible clinical presentation, compatible radiology, and no confirmed alternative diagnosis. And then finally, possible COVID-19. They don't meet the definition of COVID syndrome um, they don't really have an alternative diagnosis. And that's just to help guide patient uh, placement. And just in terms of the admit versus discharge decision, well, in general, if they're hypoxic, if they have a lot of infiltrates in their chest x-ray and many high-risk comorbidities, you're probably going to have a lower threshold for admitting the patient, particularly if they're living alone or they're unable to access help if rapidly needed. Depending on where you're working, there may be options for virtual clinic and COVID follow-up for patients that are a little bit more borderline about whether you would admit or discharge. It's worth finding out what's available locally. So looking at approach to treatment, I'm really going to think about my patients on the general medical wards here. Thankfully, the approach to treatment has changed a bit since March and April, and we have now got some therapeutic options that we can offer. I'm not really going to dwell on infection prevention and control plans, but generally as the numbers are rising in hospital, we're moving away from, from more isolation towards more cohort wards. I'm just going to talk a little bit about adjunctive therapy, thromboprophylaxis, antibiotic use, oxygen in brief, and then discharge or palliative care. So adjunctive therapy is typically offered now in cases of severe disease, that is, 
those that are hypoxic, requiring respiratory support in the hospital. And the two main options that we have are dexamethasone and remdesivir. Dexamethasone for 10 days until discharge, or until discharge, sorry, and remdesivir for five days or up to 10 days in critically unwell patients. And really the mainstay of treatment is dexamethasone. So it's cheap, it's readily available, and it's usually pretty well tolerated. And the impressive results of the recovery trial have established that a moderate dose of dexamethasone, that's six milligrams a day for 10 days, reduces mortality in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 and respiratory failure that required therapy with supplemental oxygen or mechanical ventilation. And the use of steroids has subsequently been reviewed in a prospective meta-analysis of clinical trials in critically ill patients with COVID-19. What they saw is essentially administration of systemic corticosteroids compared with usual care or placebo was associated with lower 28-day mortality. Just briefly, of course, diabetes is associated with higher mortality from COVID and dexamethasone will worsen glycemic control. So we just highlight that Diabetes UK have produced some really useful guidance on diabetes management in coronavirus patients. It's really well worth a look and I've included a, a link at the end of this presentation. We also highlight that we should be stopping SGLT2 inhibitors um, and metformin patients coming in the front door who are at greater risk of hyperglycemia. So then moving on to remdesivir, it was developed by Gilead Sciences in collaboration with the CDC and the US Army. Early trials were including use in Ebola. It really works as an antiviral drug that terminates viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase. It accumulates in peripheral blood nuclear cells. So a loading dose helps accelerate the achievement of a steady state. An initial trial evidence suggested that it can shorten recovery times for severely ill hospitalized patients. So in the intention to treat population, time to clinical improvement was numerically shorter in the remdesivir group than the control, and particularly in those treated early, so within 10 days. And the duration of invasive mechanical ventilation appeared to be numerically shorter in the remdesivir group, but neither was statistically significant. Then the ACTT1 trial went on to show that in those requiring oxygen supplementation, but not high flow oxygen or ventilatory support, remdesivir had a significant mortality benefit. And then the WHO solidarity trial is a trend towards reduced mortality in those with remdesivir requiring low flow or high flow oxygen at baseline, but not those requiring mechanical ventilation but this didn't achieve statistical significance. And remdesivir treatment is not cheap. Treatment cycle is either five or 10 days, five day course of treatment costing several thousand pounds. But for individuals at high risk of hyperinflammation who are diagnosed early during in, uh, in illness, so less than 10 days, and requiring supplemental oxygen, it may shorten the time to recovery and reduce the risk of progression. And that's quite a clinically important endpoint that may be useful in some and cost effective in some healthcare settings. So it's usually a consultant decision to start remdesivir, but it's generally pretty well tolerated. We tend to avoid giving it in patients with ALTs that are more than five times the upper limit of normal and creatinine clearance less than 30. We keep an eye on the UNEs and LFTs daily and generally stop the, if the ALT is more than five times upper limit of normal or they have symptoms of hepatitis. And you may consider stopping the treatment early if they recover and they're off oxygen within 72 hours. Then what about other therapeutics? Well, REMAP-CAP has recently shown that tocilizumab and sarilumab have reduced the relative risk of death in to 20, by 24% given to those entering intensive care. These data are yet to be published. We're not using it as yet. So certainly recovery trial is still recruiting will have much larger numbers in, in those arms. But there are ongoing trials assessing other therapies, so low-dose dexamethasone in children, colchicine, aspirin, Regeneron's antibody cocktail. So there is more data to come out yet. 
And we know that COVID-19 is associated with raised inflammatory markers and an unusual coagulopathy. So certainly raised D-dimer is very common and high values are associated with poor outcome and increased mortality. But for most of our patients, we're using standard VTE prophylaxis. However, there was a clinical impression nationally across intensive care units of a prothrombotic state. We're seeing, for example, recurrent clots within circuits and hemofiltration. And so therapeutic dose heparin was mooted in this population. But actually the remap cap study suggests that, loads of, that higher doses in ITU does not improve outcomes and may be associated with higher bleeding risk. So where we are at the moment, NICE COVID-19 guidance suggests that we consider an intermediate dose, so twice prophylactic dose in heparin in those patients on advanced respiratory, resport, eh, advanced respiratory support, so it's off label, and then when they come back to a normal ward off the respiratory support, we step them back onto normal VTE prophylaxis. And VTE is typically treated as standard. Just to be aware, there are slightly different guidelines for pregnancy um, with slightly adjusted dosing and follow up with 10 days of heparin after discharge. So then moving on to antibiotics. About 10% of patients are thought to have bacterial infections, so about 90% do not. COVID pneumonitis is viral, but it is very difficult to exclude bacterial infection of COVID pneumonitis, particularly in those more severe cases. So generally we try and keep courses of antibiotics short, so three to five days, and try and follow empiric CAP recommendations. So look at your local hospital guidelines. Often we're using once daily agents where possible, so doxycycline, azithromycin, moxifloxacin, keftraxin, for example. This is just reducing the workload and often reduces the amount of times people have to go in and out of the room where patients are on level two respiratory support. So I'm aware that there's going to be an update on respiratory support shortly, so I'm only going to touch on this very, very briefly. But we've typically been using targets of more than 94%. 88 to 92% in chronic type 2 respiratory failure. But there is an argument that we can look at lower targets. And NICE here is suggesting 92 to 96% that may be lowered yet further depending on prevailing oxygen demands. But just in terms of some general principles, we're aware that these patients can deteriorate rapidly. And the main point I just wanted to get across here is that try to be proactive in considering ceilings of care early and when are you going to escalate to level two or three care as required. There is a hierarchy of oxygen therapy. Most of us are probably familiar with the nasal cannulae, venturi system, and non-rebreather masks. But certainly we're having more patients in our ward that are requiring high flow nasal oxygen, so up to 60 litres of oxygen uh, per minute with an FiO2 of up to 98%. Then of course, you've NIV and intubation and ventilation. And these last three, high flow nasal oxygen, CPAP, NIV, are typically delivered in HDU and under guidance from our respiratory colleagues. I would just highlight that high flow nasal oxygen, CPAP, and NIV are aerosol generating procedures, and therefore we are going to look at level two PPE, and there will be a talk about that later. Just note that nebulization is not included in the list of aerosol generating procedures. So then providing your patients getting well, what about discharge provisions? So in some settings, we're able to offer home saturation probes, and virtual clinics, which will check up on patients with phone calls for those at risk of clinical deterioration. For patients leaving the hospital, we're typically offering seven days of thromboprophylaxis, whether that's doltaparin or rivaroxaban, even if they're not admitted. And in some, we're extending that out to 30 days if they're particularly high risk of clot, for example, previous VTE. For those hospitalized with severe clinical radiological diagnosis of COVID, we're arranging follow-up chest x-rays at three months. And those with persistent abnormalities are followed up in the respiratory clinic, those with PEs in the thrombosis clinic. But again, just check your local provisions. So unfortunately, several of the patients that we are caring for with ward-based ceilings of care will not do well. We do consider early involvement of palliative care and there are plenty of guidelines available out there. This is just the local hospital guidance on um, palliative management. 
But for those, for example, on high flow nasal oxygen, you may want to consider syringe drivers earlier as it might reduce pay, uh, nursing exposure. And just have a think about what are you going to do about airway support? Are you going to titrate to comfort, for example? And alongside this, I just want to mention briefly management of delirium. There are some British Geriatric Society's guidelines available. And generally, we're trying to prevent, detect early, use non-pharmacological methods, but it may be important and necessary to use things like haloperidol or spiridone in particularly agitated patients. And many of those patients, again, receiving ward-based ceilings of care will not do well. And it's often our role in the general wards to have these difficult conversations with families. And with restricted visiting, this really does become a greater part of our role. Clearly, this can be very difficult. And there are plenty of prompts available that can help just with this difficult conversation, these difficult conversations. But for those at the end of life, there may be options such as iPads available to help with communication with family members. And there may be options for relaxation and visiting restrictions in these patients as well. So finally, I just wanted to end on a slightly more positive note, a bit of hope. So we now have three vaccines approved in the UK, the Pfizer-BioNTech, the Oxford-AstraZeneca and the Moderna vaccine, and rollout is steadily picking up. So from Margaret Keenan getting her first Pfizer vaccine in early December, the rollout of the Oxford vaccine at the start of last week, We've now had about two and a half million patient, uh, people having received a first dose of vaccine in the UK. And although the next few weeks might be difficult, at least that provides some hope. So I'd just like to acknowledge um, Dr. Maheshi Ramasamy and Dr. Charlie Woodrow for their um, provision of some slides for this presentation. I'll share these slides afterwards, but these are just some useful references. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for that uh, fantastic update. It, it was really interesting to hear the advances that have been made in the management of COVID um, so from when we ran the first series of webinars in the first wave last year. So thank you very, very much. I see that there are quite a few questions for you coming up in the Q&A tab. Um, in the interest of time, we'll save the questions until the end. But um, Andrew, if you're happy to type some answers to some of those, um, th that would be great. I'll do what I can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we're now going to move on to our second uh, presentation for the evening. And for that, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Chris Turnbull and Dr. Gareth Hines, um, who are going to be talking about the respiratory support in patients with COVID-19. Uh, to introduce them, so Chris is an NIHR academic clinical lecturer at Oxford University and also respiratory registrar um, at Oxford University Hospitals. His main interests lie in sleep and ventilation and um, during the COVID-19 pandemic he has been working on the newly established respiratory support units at Oxford University Hospitals and there he has been helping to run a project evaluating the, outc the, the outcomes in these patients. Gareth is also a respiratory registrar in Oxford and a clinical research fellow at the University of Oxford. In addition, he is the joint Oxford representative to the Royal College of Physicians Trainee Committee and he co-chairs the Health Education England Thames Valley Trainee Physician Committee. He was recently awarded an MBE in the New Year's Honours List for his outstanding service to medical education during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's great to have you both here tonight. So welcome, Chris and Gareth. Thank you very much for the introduction. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, that looks great. Fantastic. So I'm going to start off by talking um, about an introduction to non-invasive respiratory support um, to outline what I'll discuss um, in the next 20 minutes. I'm going to start off by talking about definitions of respiratory failure um, before going on and talking about types of um, respiratory support, starting from simple oxygen interfaces used on every ward, um, talking about awake proning, which is something which can be done on the general ward, but we're doing a lot on, on, on the respiratory support unit, and, and finally talking about non-invasive respiratory support, including CPAP and high flow nasal oxygen. So talking about respiratory failure first, there, there are two types of respiratory failure, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 respiratory failure is defined by hypoxemia with a, an arterial um, oxygen tension of less than 8 kilopascals on room air. 
um, without the presence of hypercapnia. So CO2 levels are less than six, so normal or, or low. The pathophysiology of these two types of respiratory failure is different. Um, and um, type one respiratory failure is characterized by impaired gas exchange. So this, this is either due to um, impaired diffusion from the alveoli into the bloodstream or a mismatch of ventilation and perfusion. Examples of cause of this include pneumonia, um, where there can either be a problem with diffusion with debris in the alveoli or VQ mismatch, pulmonary again with alveolar infiltration, asthma and pulmonary embolism, where you often have shunting um, as well. Type 2 respiratory failure is distinct from type 1. Um, again, it's characterized by a low um, arterial oxygen tension, less than 8 kilopascals on air, but it also, is a, it is also has hypercapnia in association, so CO2 levels are greater than 6. Type 2 respiratory failure is also called hypercapnic ventilatory failure because its pathophysiology is characterized by a reduction in ventilation. Reductions in ventilation can be caused by reductions in ventilatory drive, so a reduced respiratory rate, or reductions in tidal volumes, meaning overall minute ventilation is reduced. It can also be caused by increased airways resistance or stiffness in the lung. By this, it, I mean either that there is loading on the, on the chest wall, such as with obesity, or deformities of the chest wall or stiff lungs, um, as found in kyphoscoliosis or, or some lung disease, diseases, and that makes it harder to move the lung, um, leading on to ventilatory failure. Finally, in outpatients, we see respiratory muscle weakness as a cause of type 2 respiratory failure. The causes of type 2 respiratory failure, the, the common ones that you'll see are things like opiate or benzodiazepine toxicity, reducing ventilatory drive and respiratory rate. Um, probably will have seen patients who've been brought into hospital and been given um, lots of oxygen in, in the ambulance with COPD. And these are patients who rely on a hypoxic drive to breathe. And when you give them too much oxygen, their drive to breathe is switched off. They retain CO2, um, stop breathing and have a reduced GCS. In addition, patients with COPD exacerbations, um, you will have seen probably patients with this condition. And then as an outpatient, um, we treat lots of patients with conditions like motor neuron disease and other neuromuscular disease, obesity and kyphoscoliosis. The rest of my talk is more going to focus on type 1 respiratory failure because that's the dominant type of respiratory failure we see with COVID-19. We haven't seen much type 2 respiratory failure, even in our patients with COPD. This slide um, shows a way in which you can distinguish between type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure, and that's by measuring the um, AA gradient. So this is essentially the difference between the al calculated alveolar oxygen tension and arterial oxygen tension. And if there's a big drop in, in the oxygen levels between the calculated alveolar and arterial oxygen tension, this suggests um, type 1 respiratory failure, either caused by impaired diffusion or a shunt. If this is normal, this suggests hypoventilation or type 2 respiratory failure. If you have type 1 respiratory failure with a big AA gradient, by giving 100% oxygen, you can tend to distinguish between um, a problem with ventilation diffusion or a shunt. And I'll go on just to talk a little bit more about those two concepts. This slide shows um, two examples, one on the left of VQ mismatch and the other of shunt. And the, the, the left hand slide um, shows two lung units um, with an airway, and these are essentially alveoli units within the lung. Um, around them is the pulmonary vasculature and pulmonary capillaries. With the left lung unit here, um, there's increased VQ ratio, either through increased ventilation or reduced, perfu or reduced perfusion. And what this means is um, that you get an increased amount of oxygen delivered to the blood in these areas, but only a small amount of blood moving through. When other units of the lung have a reduced VQ ratio, this means that less um, oxygen is able to diffuse into the blood and there's a decreased oxygen content. Overall, this means when the two units mix together, you have less oxygen content in the blood that you other otherwise would do and an AA gap. 
Shunt is distinct from this because this is a concept that blood um, is entirely shunted and entirely bypasses um, the alveolar um, capillary interface, um, meaning that no blood is picked up as it goes through the lung and um, the arterial oxygenation would then therefore be the same as venous blood. In the next section, I'm going to talk a little bit about some important concepts uh, to think about when, when thinking about respiratory support. And I think it's important to think about the inhaled percentage or the inhaled fraction of oxygen, the flow rate and the pressure that you're delivering when supplying respiratory support. The inhaled oxygen fraction is often called the FiO2. Um, this is the percentage of oxygen in an inhaled gas mix. And room air, this is 21%. And conceptually, increasing the percentage of oxygen that you're delivering to a patient increases the amount of oxygen in the alveoli and can therefore increase the amount of oxygen in the blood um, by um, overcoming reduced gas exchange. I think it's important just to note that um, this is not always going to be helpful. So again, in patients with um, chronic hypercapnia, you may switch off their hypoxic drive to breathe and that, that can lead to um, retention of CO2. And secondly, by oxygenating parts of the lung that are not well ventilated, you can switch off hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So normally, hypoxic non-ventilated areas of the lung will vasoconstrict um, and if you switch that off, that means that you will then be perfusing those areas of lung and can worsen VQ matching potentially. I think worth bearing those two things in mind, particularly in patients who uh, might be retaining um, carbon dioxide. The next concept to think about when delivering oxygen is the flow rate that you're supplying. Um, and I think flow rate is important because in patients with a, a very high work of breathing, um, their inspiratory flow rate that they require increases. And you need to match the oxygen that you're delivering to their work of breathing. In some patients with very high work of breathing, a reservoir by a bag with 15 litres of oxygen um, with an additionally filled reservoir bag is, is not adequate and they'll empty that, that, that reservoir bag entirely. And in these settings, you need higher flow systems like high flow CPAP or high flow nasal oxygen. The other role of the oxygen flow that you're supplying to the patient is in washing out the um, mask. Because by applying a mask or an oxygen delivery system to a patient, you effectively increase the anatomical airways dead space, and that can lead to rebreathing of CO2. And that flow of oxygen into the mask helps to flush that out. All masks have um, small little blow off holes in them um, and that, those holes will vary in size. Um, in reservoir bags they're really quite small and so that, that you need a high flow of oxygen to keep the CO2 flushed from um, the mask. Um, Andrew spoke a little bit about modes of ox, simple modes of oxygen delivery that you, you can um, use on board um, and I'm going to talk through these now. The first um, oxygen system that, that we use is nasal cannulae and these can deliver anywhere between about one and six litres a minute of flow, although um, anything above four can be very drying to the nasal mucosa. Um, they however don't deliver controlled oxygen, so the percentage of oxygen or the FiO2 varies between about 24 and 50 percent depending on the litres per minute and a patient's respiratory pattern. I think the advantages of nasal cannulae are that they're widely available and very simple to use and they're also comfortable for patients and patients can eat, drink and talk whilst using these. The, the disadvantages are, are that they um, are uncontrolled and deliver an unreliable FiO2. Next, we have a simple oxygen face mask delivering between 5 and 10 litres a minute. Again, not controlled, delivering anywhere between about 40 and 60% oxygen. Again, they're widely available and easy to use. Next, we have Venturi oxygen masks. These are helpful in that they're a way of delivering controlled oxygen on the ward. The flow rate that you need to use depends on the percentage um, uh, mask that you're choosing. So that the, the, the mask comes um, and you can get interchangeable venturi valves that slot onto the end of the mask. 
Um, for some reason, this, is, this picture is slightly out of order. In, in any case, the blue is a 24%, the white um, 28, yellow 35, red 40, and green 60%. They'll all have a number with litres per minute on it, and that's what you need to set the oxygen flow rate to um, from the wall. Otherwise, you won't be providing the percentage of oxygen um, that the mask um, should deliver. They're, they're easy to use and simple, and, and the real advantage is they provide that controlled and you know exactly how much oxygen you're giving to a patient. They aren't, aren't suitable for severe hypoxemia because they don't provide very high FiO2s or very high flow rates at higher FiO2s. The next is a reservoir mask, and this is very useful in emergency settings. It delivers a, a high flow rate of oxygen, 15 litres a minute, plus the extra volume um, in the reservoir bag. You remember you inflate them by putting your finger um, over the holes and allowing the reservoir ma mask to inflate prior to usage. They deliver a percentage of oxygen between 60 and 90%. Um, again, they're uncontrolled, but they are helpful in patients with severe hypoxemia. So a summary of simple respiratory support that you can provide on the ward, um, nasal cannulae uh, used in mild hypoxemia, then simple face masks and, and, and venturi masks can be used in, in, in moderate hypoxemia or in those who need controlled oxygen. Um, the reservoir mask is really only very useful in severe hypoxemia and patients who are needing this certainly um, should be thinking about escalating care if that's appropriate. Next, I'm going to talk with um, a couple of slides on, on awake proning. So proning is something that's been used for a long time in intensive care um, in patients who are intubated. But um, since um, the COVID-19 pandemic, we've used awake proning, so proning patients um, who are not intubated. This has several theoretical advantages. So theoretically, it improves ventilation to um, the dorsal lung portions, to the portions of the lung around the back, um, which are high volume areas. So potentially can increase ventilation by lying in this position. In addition, you get a change in the distribution of blood to the, in, in the lungs, and that can improve VQ matching. Thirdly, it can offset the, the, the pressure of the heart um, on the lungs, and, and that can again improve respiratory dynamics. So overall, lying in a prone or a semi-prone or lateral position can improve oxygenation. However, the data that is available at the moment really only shows that awake proning improves oxygenation in the short term. There's not good long-term data or and there's not good data to show that this improves hard outcomes such as need for intubation or mortality. That's not to say that it, it's not been shown to be ineffective, it, it just simply hasn't been studied in good enough studies to date. So I think this is something that you can do with patients on the ward. Um, you can ask patients if they're able to lie on, on their tummy to lie prone themselves, or you can ask physiotherapists um, to assist you in doing this. Um, I think it's important to remember that patients need to be able to do this independently and safely. And what we're aiming for is for patients to prone for a couple of hours at a time. This is much less than the, the around 16 hours a day that patients will be put in a prone position when they're intubated. So we aim for patients um, to lie prone for a couple of hours, then in a left lateral and right lateral position for two hours each, and to do this two or three times during the day. Important safety checklist is that to make sure that the patient can get back into a supine position. I think it's also really important to check that it actually does improve their oxygenation because it doesn't in all patients and some it may worsen their oxygenation. So once you've got a patient into a prone position, check their saturations again. It might take a couple of minutes for them to improve and particularly as, as exerting and moving into a prone position may cause their oxygen levels to fall. Um, and also check, it's worth checking after this that they can still reach a call bell so they can call for assistance to get out of this position. I mentioned pressure as the third important concept when delivering oxygen support. And this is really relevant when patients are escalated beyond the ward to respiratory support units to, to receive positive airway pressure. Um, positive airway pressure can either be applied constantly throughout the respiratory cycle or at differing pressures in, in, during inspiration and expiration. The main focus of what I'll talk about in this section is on continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP. Um, this is also called, confusingly also called, 
peak or positive end expiratory pressure. And this is mainly what we use um, to treat patients with COVID. So CPAP is used to splint open airways in outpatients. We use this in patients with obstructive sleep apnea to splint open their upper airway. And acutely, we use this to splint open lower airways and alveoli. By doing this, this recruits more volume of lung uh, and that's then therefore available for ventilation to improve oxygenation. CPAP machines will deliver a pressure um, from between four to 20 centimetres of water. And I think it's important to, to recognise this because high flow nasal oxygen, um, which is often also used um, in, in patients with hypoxemia, really will only deliver up to a pressure of around a maximum of five centimetres of water. And, and for this reason is a second line choice. This diagram is just a schematic representation of pleural pressures throughout the respiratory cycle. So when patients are breathing in, they, they have generate a negative intrapleural pressure and then positive pressures during expiration. And all that CPAP does is it shifts this up to a positive pressure at whatever the CPAP mask is set at, here at 10 centimetres of water. And that pressure is held constant throughout the respiratory cycle whilst the patient continues to breathe with their own normal respiratory pattern. Um, we use um, CPAP machines to deliver this. Um, typically, we'll use low flow machines, um, either in Oxford, we use a, one called a Vivo 40 or an IP3 machine. There are lots of different machines which can be used. And these low flow machines can be used in severe hypoxemia um, without hypercapnia, so type 1 respiratory failure in pulmonary edema, COVID. Um, you can add about 15 litres of oxygen to these systems and that will deliver around a, a, a 60% six, oxygen, um, but you don't know what oxygen you're delivering with these systems, that's dependent on the machine. Likewise, you don't know exactly how much flow you're delivering to the patient. Um, the, the advantages are that these may improve oxygenation um, and that might delay or, 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 or entirely negate the need for intubation in some patients. The disadvantage is that there's limited availability of these systems and they need expertise. They are aerosol generating and need that level 2 PP that we, we, we've heard mentioned already. Um, these may delay intubation and we don't know if um, they actually have any outcome on mortality, that whether they improve mortality in COVID-19. Certainly they seem to be um, helpful in um, reducing pressures on level three areas where patients are intubated. So we can hold patients in respiratory wards with CPAP, taking the pressure off intensive care units. We also do use high flow CPAP systems. Um, and these are two examples of the 60 or a wall CPAP circuit. The advantage of these is that they can provide much higher flow rates of oxygen, 70 litres or above, and oxygen percentages are up to 100%. The disadvantages, in addition to low flow CPAPs, is that they use an, uh, an incredibly high amount of oxygen and ox uh, hospitals have a limited amount of oxygen that they can use um, before the pressure in the system will drop too much and, and then we won't be able to ventilate patients. So we have to really be very careful in which patients we use these in and not be too liberal with their use. High flow nasal oxygen um, is our second line choice. Um, it's delivered by nasal cannulae and, and a system set up such as this. Again, high flow rates, high percentage of oxygen, and it, it can be more comfortable for patients um, because it, it's less of a tight fitting interface. In addition, patients can use these for breaks so they can eat and drink with this system. I think importantly, as I've already stressed, they don't deliver um, CPAP or PEEP, um, and, and so they're often used second line. And to summarise these support systems, so CPAP um, at low flow can be used in patients. We're, we're using it in patients who are needing more than 40% oxygen and more than 8 litres a minute of oxygen. Um, and they can be helpful, um, but they don't deliver very high flow rates or high FiO2s. High flow CPAP systems um, are used in patients needing more than 60% of an oxygen or more than fit or a non-rebreathe mask when they arrive with us. They can deliver very high flow rates of oxygen and control oxygen up to 100%. High flow nasal oxygen we can use in patients who don't tolerate CPAP or for breaks, again, providing high flow and very high oxygen percentages. 
just to end up with, I'm going to talk about non-invasive ventilation. NIV um, is also termed non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, BiPAP, pressure support ventilation. There are lots of terms and essentially they all mean the same thing. NIV is where there are differential positive pressures delivered during expiration and during inspiration. It's used in hypercapnic type 2 respiratory failure and in addition to providing positive pressure, it augments tidal volumes to deliver an extra volume of ventilation to patients to help clear CO2 from the system. This diagram really shows the difference with CPAP. So you have a low pressure or an EPAP and that pressure is increased after a patient triggers a breath and, and that delivers a, a higher volume than the patient is able to generate themselves. At the end of the inspiration, pressure drops back down to a holding positive pressure during expiration. Again, it can be delivered by a variety of machines, either low flow or high flow. Um, the, again, the advantage of the high flow machine is that you can deliver higher flow rates and higher oxygen percentages. In reality, we don't, haven't needed to use this very much in COVID because we've mostly seen type 1 respiratory failure. We tend to use this more in patients with exacerbations of COPD and often there we don't need to deliver these very high levels of oxygen. So the um, lower flow machines such as the V40 or the NP3 plus machine are perfectly adequate. So I'm going to stop there and hand over to Gareth. Perfect. Hi, um, I'm going to try and share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can we see that? Yes, that's great. Thanks, Gareth. Can you see the thing on the side as well, or you don't see that? Uh, no, just just the full screen, full slide. Perfect. Great. So I'm Gareth. I'm one of the other um, registrars. Um, and Chris, um, Chris has, has taken the, the, the hard bit, the, um, the theory side of things a bit that I, I don't really understand that well. Um, the, the, the good news, at least for me, is that the actual treatment of COVID in terms of uh, the oxygen, the level two oxygen um, support, so um, when you need more than just your simple venturi or, or nasal oxygen, it's actually, it's not, it's not that hard. It's reasonably straightforward. So it, it can seem quite complicated. Um, with all the machines and the devices and things, but hopefully um, over the next few minutes, sort of 15 minutes or so, we'll, we'll go through and, and show this actually reasonably straightforward and quite simple. Um, so uh, it, I think it is it is worth, I, I know we've, we've talked about this a little bit already, but I think it really is worth emphasizing um, that uh, the, the, the general considerations uh, for oxygen in COVID-19, um, that, that we tend to target oxygen, oxygen saturations between about 92 and 96. Um, but as mentioned, we, we will reduce that if patients who are at risk of type two respiratory failure, so the risk of building up their, their carbon dioxide levels, then, then we will, as usual, adjust the, the oxygen required, the level saturation targets down a little bit. Uh, and the key is obviously using the lowest oxygen possible to achieve this. And that's important for both the patient, but also uh, for the oxygen um, supply in the hospital. And as Chris mentioned, you know, there have been lots of occasions when uh, oxygen levels have dropped in various hospitals and, and caused you know, significant uh, harm uh, to patients. And, and, the, and the risk is not that one, um, you know, that, that one device may not work. It, it's actually that the pressure in the system drops to the point where ventilators shut off. And, and so it is important that we, we are you know, judicious of our use of oxygen. Um, and, and the second general consideration that we've, we've talked about is it is really important to determine the ce ceiling of care early for these patients. Uh, and the reason for that is um, that they can deteriorate um, reasonably quickly. And by that, I mean, not sort of your acute severe asthmatic over, over minutes, but generally over the course of a few hours. Um, and in that instance, it is important uh, to have had these discussions early. So when the patient is, is still um, awake and alert, um, then, then we'll try and make the decisions about um, the level of support that we would provide if needed. Um, proning works for some, as we've mentioned before, so it's worth, worth trying that, but it is probably more of a temporizing measure um, than anything else. Um, so uh, we will talk about that in a little bit more, but if your um, patient is, is you know, just about maintaining their, their oxygen levels, 
um, when they're prone, but not when they're not, then it, it's probably worth having a fairly close eye on them and maybe considering escalating their oxygen um, to a level two uh, area um, if needed. So when would you escalate a patient's oxygen? Um, well, what we tend to use is, is a, a cutoff of around uh, greater than 40% to keep their saturations around 94. And there's a bit of flex in that, and that does depend on your bed base and your local hospital policies. Um, but so we tend to use venturis here, um, and um, and yeah, so, so if your patient is on the highest venturi, so 60% uh, to keep their saturations, that's probably the time in which you would not start thinking about whether they would be appropriate for the high dependency unit or respiratory support unit um, for, uh, for, for um, level two oxygen support, such as uh, CPAP. Um, and just on the venturis, I think, um, as Chris mentioned, it is important um, to, to have a look at that because it's surprising the number of times you see the patient on the ward sees uh, venturi oxygen at the wall um, is at quite a different level to, to what it should be. And, and then it becomes quite ineffective. So uh, really do um, have a look at that. So, so, and, and it's written on the actual um, uh, the, the plastic uh, venturi device itself. So it gives you a bit of a hint. So, so do check that rather than just assuming that, you know, that they're, they're desaturating um, on 60%. Um, CPAP is, is preferable to high flow nasal oxygen and, and to BiPAP for, for reasons that Chris has talked about and we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, and this is actually useful for us because CPAP is far easier uh, to use than, than, than BiPAP is. Um, so that makes our job a little bit simpler. Um, and then you should consider intubation, um, uh, whether that's required prior to changing an oxygen device. So what I mean by that is if the patient is deteriorating reasonably quickly, um, you know, rather than sort of faffing around trying different oxygen devices, if, if they're looking pretty unwell, their respiratory rate's high, uh, the saturations are low, then, then consider early, early uh, um, ask uh, of the intensive care unit for support. Now, maybe that you can hold them without that, but, um, but it's useful just to, uh, to have their support there if available. Um, and as Andrew mentioned as well, of course, um, CPAP, high flow, BiPAP um, and intubation are considered aerosol generating procedures. So anytime you go near a patient who's on these things and they're COVID positive, uh, then you uh, require level two PPE. And obviously we've got our session on that coming up. So why CPAP for, for COVID-19? Now, um, we had a, a talk about this last night um, among ourselves. And um, yeah, it, there are lots of theories, but I think it's not. No, nothing is, is certain really as to why CPAP is useful in, in improving oxygenation for patients. And there are a couple of probably competing or pro main theories as to why it might be. Um, and, and one of them is that the patients with COVID-19 often have normal lung compliance. So, so that means that they, the lung expands and contracts quite easily, you know, as normal. So it's not fibrotic and scarred, difficult to move. Um, and so, so the lungs are what we call highly recruitable, i.e. that means that if you give a bit of extra pressure, you can really reinflate parts of the lungs that were previously underinflated, uh, and then you can improve oxygenation in that way. Because um, this is, I still think this is one of the most extraordinary things about this condition for me. Um, two really extraordinary things. One is that some patients get no symptoms whatsoever and some, you know, die from the from the same virus. The second thing I find really interesting, and I can't understand it, is this silent hypoxemia thing where you have patients who are sat in the 60s or 70s um, and, and they're, they're completely oblivious to it, just carrying on as normal. It's, it's uh, you know, very strange and I can't understand that. Chris, uh, maybe I'll have to explain better. Um, the second potential theory uh, as to why CPAP works is um, instead of just recruiting the underventilated bits of, of lung, it may be uh, there's a theory that the pulmonary vasculature is a problem here and it's a failure of, of normal pulmonary hypoxic vasoconstriction. So that means if a bit of the lung is under uh, ventilated, so there's not getting enough oxygen in there, the, um, the, the, the blood supply will close down and, and shunt the blood to a better bit of the lung. Um, and CPAP may, may help in this blood uh, shunting. And so they're the two competing theories, but it does, seem to, it does seem to work. We do seem to be able to hold patients on CPAP. Um, without the need for intubation. And we're, we're doing that you know, considerably more in the second wave than the first wave to try and avoid the need for, for the intensive care unit. So what, what do we do practically? So, so what are our escalation strategies? Now, um, uh, Andrew mentioned this already, um, so I won't talk a uh, huge amount about it, but um, uh, you do need to, to, to get this in fairly early. I think it is really important and the clinical frailty scale is, is useful. Um, 
Uh, I think um, you know, what, what we tend to do is, is again, is look at the functional status of the patient and their, and their comorbidities and, and, and determine at what level we would treat them. So are they somebody who'd be appropriate for the intensive care or are they somebody who'd be appropriate just for the high dependency unit and level two option support? Or are they somebody who wouldn't be appropriate for either? And to be honest with you, are in the high dependency unit in, in the respiratory support units, the level two oxygen, we're, we're quite um, uh, generous. We don't, you know, we, it, we, we will admit most people if they need it. So we, we don't tend to have very strict um, sort of entry criteria. Um, but but the, this is important more for deciding who would go on to, in, to be intubated if needs be. So that is, if you've got them on level two in the high dependency unit, they're not doing so well, who is the sort of person you would take uh, or ask the intensive care units to have a look at. And again, getting this in early is really important because patients can deteriorate reasonably quickly and uh, getting that in, our discussion with their families, checking their functional status, etc., checking with the patients themselves, of course, uh, is, can be quite a useful thing to do. Um, and, and five is kind of the, the key cutoff. Um, so everywhere I think will have um, uh, their own policies on this, and this is kind of a generic policy. This is similar to what we run in Oxford. I think Oxford is now slightly more complicated than this, but um, but generally just for, for ease of uh, reference, what we tend to do is we decide who's got an HDU ceiling and who's got an ICU ceiling. And then the patients who are, have an HDU ceiling what we will tend to do is if they are um, on 40% or more oxygen, uh, needing 40% or more oxygen, and if they're remaining hypoxic, then uh, we will generally try to transfer them to our high dependency unit. Uh, we put them on a non-rebreathe for the transfer down. When they're there, we'll try a bit of a weight proning. We may try that on the wards as well um, to, to see if it helps. Um, and uh, it, it, they may, it may help some patients, it does, some patients can't tolerate it. Um, but if they remain hypoxic, then we will move reasonably rapidly onto, onto device CPAP. And some people, if we tried the proning on the orders and it hasn't worked, or they remain hypoxic, then, then we just move them straight onto device CPAP. Um, and uh, I'll mention then how we go about setting that up um, in a minute. Um, but if the patient remains hypoxic, then you can increase their oxygen. Uh, amount that's being entrained through the CPAP, um, so sort of at the wall, um, and then uh, if they remain hypoxic, despite this, and this is where um, high flow uh, CPAP that Chris has mentioned comes in. Now I won't talk about this because I think it is probably um, something that's slightly more specialist, um, uh, and uh, so probably isn't going to be applicable to most people generally. Um, whereas I think um, CPAP is something that probably people will come across a little bit more frequently. So I'll, I'll focus on that. Um, something to, to bear in mind is that patients often don't tolerate CPAP. And, and what do you do in, in those circumstances? Well, if they don't tolerate it, then you can consider a bit of sedation. Um, so a bit of cautious use of midazolam. And we rarely do that, to be honest with you, um, just because we're worried about knocking off the um, hypoxic drive. But it can, it can be useful. So, so consider it if the patient is really not tolerating CPAP and you think that this is the best thing for them. So they've got an HDU ceiling, not an ICU ceiling. Um, and if they're still in, intolerant of CPAP, then, then you, you, know, you can try them out on high flow. This is generally what we tend to do, CPAP first. If that doesn't work uh, and they're still hypoxic, then, then high flow nasal oxygen. Um, if they've got an ICU ceiling of care, then um, reasonably similar in the approach, but just with these outs, so if they're rap rapidly deteriorating, ask ICU. Uh, again, try weight proning, but, it, but if they're rapidly deteriorating, ICU. And what we would tend to do is if they're um, on, on CPAP here, we would get ICU's opinion reasonably quickly. Now, we do use... Uh, these um, other devices for these patients as well, especially now ICUs are getting really full, but it's worth informing ICU when, when you're kind of at maximal uh, CPAP, device CPAP um, that, that, they, that, that, that they may need to take a look at this patient. So device setup. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, how do we set it up? So we've got a video coming up, which is good. Um, and, uh, and a bit before that, we, we um, worth reiterating above about 40%, you maintain the saturation is 94%. That's when we try to use um, CPAP. We've talked a little bit about the physiology um, and the practical advice is, is that CPAP can actually be delivered via a CPAP machine um, or via a BiPAP machine that's set CPAP made. And, and I haven't gone through because it's, it's um, uh, all, all the devices are slightly different, but they're all reasonably straightforward. You just turn them on, select the mode, uh, and then select the pressure. Um, and what we tend to do is we start, so the patient will come to us on 15 meters of oxygen, we'll usually put that and train that through as we're starting the patient on CPAP. We start them at reasonably low pressures, four to five centimeters of water. Um, and uh, if that's not enough to, to sort the patient out and improve their oxygen saturations, then we will increase it to 
up to eight, maybe even 14 centimeters of water. But we try, try, we can usually get away with a little bit lower um, pressures because our lungs are really compliant. So that means that you don't need a huge amount of pressure to, to really help um, improve the, 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 um, the, the ventilation or the amount of oxygen that the patient gets. So anyway, so you start at 45, increase if, if needed over about 30 minutes or so. Um, and then you titrate the oxygen to, to sort of keep the sats about 92, 96. So, so get them on, get the pressure to the desired amount, to the saturations, okay, and then you can start weaning the oxygen down. The oxygen down. Um, and then consider small doses of sedation, you know, to, uh, for tolerability if, if needed. So general advice on how you set up these patients. Now, the, the, what we should be using, um, if available, is a non-vented mask rather than the normal masks that patient use, uh, patients use uh, for CPAP at home if they've got obstructive sleep apnea, for instance. And the reason for that um, is that it, the, the normal masks have little holes in the side. And that, of course, means that the, um, uh, the COVID can be aerosolized um, from that directly into the room. So we try to use a non-vented mask, which which prevents that. But what you then really need is a viral filter and this exhalation port. And this is really important. I'll show you a schematic of that in just a minute, just to go through it. Um, general advice, attach the mask to the patient before switching the machine on. And that's um, mainly because it's, it's impossible uh, to get the, the, the mask fit right once the machine is on, because it's just blowing air in the patient. Um, fit the mask, so when you see the patient and you want to set them up on it, the mask should be fitting from the bridge of the nose to the crease of the chin. So it's quite quite common that you'll see a mask that's actually over the bottom of the chin, and that means that there's a lot of leak coming out. So, so you do have a look at that and try and size it right. There are different size masks available. Um, and then always switch the machine off before the breaking the circuit, so before disconnecting anything, switch the machine off. And then again, that means that you're not aerosolizing COVID and all over the room. Um, so how do we actually set up the, uh, the, the circuit itself, the, the CPAP circuit? So we've got a non-vented mask, they're different to the normal one, so there's no holes here. Then you've got your viral filter um, that hopefully picks up all the coronavirus. Then you've got your oxygen uh, in, which goes here. And then you've got, this is a really important bit um, that it's worth really making sure is, is present. The, uh, you've got your um, exhalation port here. Um, uh, that allows the CO2 to, to, to come out. So if you can imagine if this wasn't here, the patient would just be essentially, you've got pressure coming in from the device, and the patient's just going to be breathing in and out the same air, and the CO2 will, will increase. And I remember Chris actually in the first wave um, came across a patient who, who didn't have this, and they became CR, CR, CO2 narcosed on the ward, uh, and, he, and luckily he picked it up and, and, and then and sorted the patient out. But it is it is an important thing to, to check for. So what does it look like? Well, you can see it here. This is kind of, it will vary, but it's basically just a little tube, a little um, bit of plastic with a little bit of a hole in. So the, the air will come out of that. I just saw a patient on, um, I'm on call at the moment, hence the scrubs, and I just saw a patient in uh, resus who was saying that she didn't think that the, the, this was set up right because there's air coming out the side and it was causing a bit of confusion among various among various staff members. But actually, that's what we want, you know, the air to come out here. And it's this is got the viral filter to so say, actually, this shit air should be uh, reasonably coronavirus free, hopefully. Um, so, so uh, and then you've got the tubing and then you've got the device. Um, and so you set all this up, you attach it to the patient, turn the device on uh, and then turn the oxygen on. And, and we've got a little video here and um, hopefully you'll be able to hear this okay. This. Um, so we're going to go through how to set up a non-vented circuit for a patient with either suspected or confirmed COVID-19. Uh, who's going to go on uh, CPAP or bi-level non-invasive ventilation. So you need a non-vented mask with headgear attached. We've got a viral bacterial filter, which is the yellow filter, an oxygen connector, an exhale valve, and the exhale valve may look slightly different to the one that we're showing you here, ventilated tubing, a second filter if available and the machine that you're going to use. So the filter is attached to the mask, followed by the oxygen connector. And the oxygen tubing can be attached but not turned on at the wall yet. The exhale valve is then fitted, followed by the ventilator tubing. The second filter, which is 
attached to the machine. So you're now ready to set it up on the patient. Remember that you should be wearing level two PPE. And once you're with the patient, the sequence of action is mask on the patient, you turn the ventilator on, and then you turn the walled oxygen on. Great. So hopefully, um, hopefully that was reasonably clear um, about how to set it up. But these videos are available actually online, and we can um, we'll put the, uh, the 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 link up um, so for you to catch. So um, so what happens next? So so say so you've seen a patient, you've set them up, or you're asked to see a patient on call, and they're on CPAP, and you want to know. Um, how you and something's not quite right they're not looking right or um the, the the oxygen levels are a bit low so so what what should you do how would you troubleshoot any particular problems well the first thing it's really important to do is um take a step back and and, and just have a look at the whole situation so make sure you know the machine is on and um, but, but make sure that there's no breaks in the circuit so so look at it look at every aspect of it so you want the device you want the uh, dust filter there you want the tubing uh, and then you want the setup um, with the, the mask in, in place. Um, and, and so make sure that's all correct and, and look, make sure there's no breaks or, or slits. Sometimes the tubing develops slits and um, there can be a leak there. So just have a look at the whole setup first. Um, check you've got an expiratory port in place. And now that's Im important if you've got the non-vented setup. Some centers are using uh, the normal devices with uh, with holes in. So you have a look at the actual, and the way to tell is you can look at the actual device, uh, the, the mask itself. It's, if it's got little holes in it, um, then uh, then it's it's a vented mask and it doesn't need the expiratory port. If there's no holes in the um, in the actual mask, then it's a non-vented. Oops, sorry, it's a non-vented, and uh, and you need to have the expiratory port in place. So make sure that's there. Check see if there's a significant leak. And most devices, most machines will tell you that, and there'll be it'll be alarming, and and you can just kind of have a scroll through. And we consider a, a leak, a significant leak, greater than about 20 or so. Uh, and if that's a, if that's the case, then then have a look at the mask, make sure it's the right fit, uh, tighten it, maybe change the mask, make sure there's no leak um, anywhere in the system. Uh, next thing is is if it's still not quite right, then you can change the expiratory filter because they uh, can get clogged, um, and and uh, and so you know changing that. Uh, sorry, this should be uh, uh, the uh, viral filter. These are the things that can get clogged. Um, so make sure that uh, that that's um, that that's changed. But just make sure again that you turn off the machine, turn off the device before you break the circuit. Otherwise, you'll just risk aerosolizing uh, coronavirus into the room. Um, uh, and 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 while you're doing it, um, you should be able to change it fairly quickly. So you shouldn't need to put the patient on uh, non-rebreathe mask while while you're changing it out. But just make sure you've got um, non-rebreathe there, just in case there's any problem with turning the, the machine back on. Um, and then again, uh, patients we put on this PEEP, so sort of up to, you know, if they're on reasonably high PEEP, 10 centimetres or 14 centimetres, that can be the thing that patients don't like very much. So consider reducing that PEEP down a little bit if they're not tolerating it particularly well. Um, and, and hopefully then if you follow that through, you should be able to sort out most problems uh, with CPAP um, uh, yourself. And if not, then, you know, obviously call, call for backup uh, from, from respiratory or, for, or from the intensive care unit. So in conclusion, um, we, we tend to target oxygen saturation of 92 to 96, slightly reduced in COPD, use the lowest level of oxygen we can to get a, to, to achieve this, uh, but consider escalating when they're above about 40% to keep saturations 94% or above. Determine the ceiling of care early. Proning does work for some uh, if you can tolerate it. Um, but as Chris mentioned, there's no real evidence that uh, it improves outcome, but it certainly makes the numbers look a bit better um, in many cases. Uh, CPAP is, is preferable to high flow uh, for type 1 respiratory failure. Consider high flow if they can't tolerate the CPAP or if they're you know, needing breaks for meals and things like that. So if they get CPAP most of the time, time a bit of high flow for their meals is absolutely fine. Uh, BiPAP and IV for a subset of patients who might have type 2 respiratory failure, but you'd want a blood gas to, to, to make sure that, you know, that, that that is needed um, before starting that. And again, you know, make sure you've got respiratory uh, kind of support if, um, if, if you need for that. And then the practical advice, um, you, you put them on the, the, put the, put the 50 litres of oxygen, start with about 45 centimetres of water, increase as necessary to get the sats up, and then you can start weaning the oxygen down. And then troubleshooting, so if there's a problem with it, make sure the circuit's okay, check for a leak, make sure the mask looks okay, and for non-vented masks, it makes sure that there's an expiratory port in place.
Uh, here's some, a bit of further uh, information. Uh, and just to thank Chris, obviously, for this, uh, Nick Tolbert, um, he's one of the consultants, Annabelle Nickel, Henry Bettinson, and actually Josephine Lightard, who I haven't put on this, but she was the one who was in the, the video earlier. So thanks very much. <laughs> Jared, thank you so much. And also to Chris um, for two great presentations. Um, I think you really summarized that very well, some very complex physiology that you um, summarized really well. So thank you very, very much. I see there are, again, lots of questions coming through um, for both Gareth and Chris. Um, we will try to cover as many of them as possible during the panel discussion at the end. Um, but and otherwise Gareth and Chris will try to type some answers in as well. There is also a lot of um, really great resources in the chat um, so do have a look at those when you get a chance. Um, I would now like to welcome our final presenter for the evening, uh, Professor Jenny Wilson, who's going to be talking to us about personal protective equipment. Jenny is a professor of healthcare epidemiology at the Richard Wells Research Centre in the, at the University of West London, and she's worked in the field of infection prevention and control for over 30 years. She's been on the board of the Infection Prevention Society for 10 years and assumed the role of president of the society last year. Her current research interests include the use of clinical gloves, improving the management of urinary catheters and hydration in the frail elderly patient. And um, so tonight she's kindly offered to join us to talk about PPE. Welcome, Jenny. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and I think um, you'll get the idea that my research interests include gloves as we go through this talk because it features um, gloves in various places. Um, so I was asked to talk about PPE and um, I think most people, when they think of infection control, think of PPE. Um, but what I said was that actually you need to consider infection control in a much broader way um, than just PPE. And that is what I'm gonna do in the next 25, 30 minutes. Um, um, so uh, this is roughly what I'm going to go through. I'm going to look briefly at routes of transmission because they're relevant to infection control. I'm going to look at the hierarchy of controls, then PPE, and also I'll in, consider protecting both patients and staff because it isn't just about staff protection, it's about considering how we protect patients too. So I'm sure you are familiar with the routes of transmission of COVID. Um, I'm not going to discuss the new variant, only to say that there is no reason to think that the new variant transmits in any different way to the previous variants that we've been working with. Um, it may have a higher uh, viral load and that may increase its ability to spread to a greater number of people. So instead of one person transferring it to one of their other contacts, it, it's possible that the high viral loads mean that it's able to spread to two or three of their contacts instead. But the precautions are the same and the routes of transmission will be the same. So predominantly um, transmission is by exposure directly from droplets sneezed or coughed um, out of the respiratory tract and they land on somebody else's uh, mouth, nose or eyes. Um, if that's going to happen, so if those particles are going to directly land on your mucous membranes, then you need relatively close contact to that person. So the guidance suggests that you need to be within about two meters for that to happen. And I think we've all sat with people, I've sat with people myself and watched those large droplets expelled from your mouth. Uh, and, and you can see how it is relatively easy for those to, to land on mucous membranes. But the second important route of transmission is that those droplets will then land on surfaces. Um, those contaminated surfaces, if you touch them with your hands and then you use your hands to touch your mucous membranes, you will transfer the virus indirectly from those surfaces onto your mucous membranes. This is really important to remember in the care environment because again, if you stop to think about it, we touch our faces all the time unconsciously. So one of the habits you need to get into is not touching 
your face. You must not touch your mouth or your nose. Even if you've got gloves on, when you have gloves on, you tend to feel protected, but your gloves will touch those surfaces in exactly the same way, and they will transfer the virus directly onto your mucous membranes if you touch them, particularly if you're doing things like fiddling with your mask. And then the third route that we know about is about exposure to much tinier particles called respiratory aerosols. Um, and the most likely way that will occur is during procedures or processes that generate a high number of these respiratory aerosols. And these particles, because they are much smaller, are able to um, persist in the air over longer distances. They don't, the, the gravity doesn't cause them to drop to the, to, to the, to, to the ground uh, so rapidly. Now, I think um, the more simplistic version of considering droplets and aerosols has always been that, um, that droplets are the big particles that are, are greater than five microns in size and they drop rapidly to the ground and they are associated with um, coughing in particular. Now, there's no doubt that cough generates more particles and it generates mostly those larger particles. But we know that a combination of the very tiny particles, less than five microns, the aerosols and the droplets are emitted due, during both breathing and talking. Um, but the amount produced varies hugely between individuals. And of course, the other factor in this is about viral load. So we all produce droplets and, and aerosols as we, as we breathe and talk. But if we're infected with the virus and we have a high viral load, then some of those particles will contain virus and then present a risk of transmission. The viral load is highest at and around the time of symptom onset, probably the sort of day before and at symptom onset. And so that's the peak point at which people are gonna be infectious. The smaller particles may travel further, but because they're tiny, they're less likely to carry virus. And so when we think about risk of transmission, it's important to think about the proximity, so how close you are to somebody with the infection. So within two meters is the greatest risk. The duration of exposure, so a brief walking past somebody um, or there for just a few minutes presents less risk than spending several minutes or hours in close proximity to that patient. And then we can mitigate the risk, so we can reduce the risk of, of transferring those infectious droplets onto the, air, the points of access, so the mucous membranes, by using physical barriers such as masks or eye protection, and by ensuring that as far as we can that the ventilation in the general air is very good. And I'll talk more about why that's important in a minute. So speaking and coughing, and, and this is a really nice illustration that I think gives you a, a clear idea about how how there isn't this, this sort of sharp distinction between particle size, there's just a continuum of a whole range of particle size. The larger ones drop more rapidly to the floor, the smaller ones may, um, may stay in the air for longer, the mask acts as that barrier and, and redirects the direction in which those particles will go. Um, the am amount of particles produced depends on force and volume. Um, but also is strongly influenced by the local environment, by humidity, by the temperature, and by the general flow of air in the area. And nearly all of the fluid and the virus, of course, is contained within those larger droplets. So for speaking on coughing, um, there is a 10 to 100 times more liquid in droplets than there are in those very tiny particles that float around in the air for longer. So whilst we worry hugely about aerosols, it's important to consider them in terms of that whole epidemiology, not just the fact that aerosols are there, but also the likelihood that you, you will inhale an aerosol at, or that it will carry a virus um, particle. The other key factor, and one of the previous speakers touched on this um, uh, when talking about uh, finding out when symptoms uh, started is that the RNA is detected for about one or two days before the symptoms start and it's shed for approximately eight days. It does vary slightly and there is some evidence that people with the most severe disease may shed for a little bit longer than that. But a positive PCR test just detects the RNA. It does not detect live virus. And of course, 
RNA will exist in dead cells as they're shed out of the respiratory tract for a very long period of time, up to about six weeks. So a positive PCR test doesn't tell you that somebody is infectious. And in fact, for most of the patients that you see, they're unlikely to be infectious for more than about two weeks after their symptoms started. And I mentioned about viral loads peaking at symptom onset. Of course, we do have to be concerned about asymptomatic cases, not because they're patients necessarily, although they may be, they may have been admitted for other reasons and end up acquiring virus in hospital, um, but also for staff. And around about 20% of cases, as far as we know, are asymptomatic. The risk of transmission appears to be lower, uh, although the, the precision of those estimates is, is not good at the moment. Um, the reason surfaces are a problem is because those droplets end up on surfaces and they will get there either directly from the patient, but also because staff in contact with the patient touch lots of surfaces with their hands and so they will transfer the viruses around surfaces as well. And certainly studies that have looked at surfaces will find uh, contamination on a wide range of, of surfaces, often in fairly low concentration, the most common places they're found are places that are touched a lot by people and that really illustrates how easy it is to transfer virus around an area on surfaces because you've got it on your hands and, and that's why the infection control precautions are so important. Fortunately it's really easily inactivated by detergents and disinfectants and it doesn't survive on surfaces for more than, than around 72 hours. Ventilation is a really key factor. Um, it's why the risk outdoors is really quite negligible because airborne particles are really rapidly diluted um, and dispersed by movements in the air. Um, if you can improve ventilation in a hospital setting, that is a really good thing. And even simple things like opening windows and doors to ensure that you get a better circulation of air through an area is really helpful to uh, dispersing and diluting virus. And it has to be said that the studies that have been done trying to sample virus in air have either found no virus at all or found it in really tiny numbers. So there isn't a huge amount of evidence that, um, that we accumulate vast amounts of, of COVID in air and it, it presents a huge risk, but we absolutely need to try and ensure that we mitigate that risk by uh, doing what we can with ventilation. Um, now, I mentioned at the beginning that I wanted to talk about the hierarchy of controls, and this is because it is widely accepted as part of, of health and safety uh, policy and has been for many years that PPE, personal protective equipment, is the last resort, not the first resort. So there are many things that we do in order to minimise the risk that staff and indeed other patients are exposed to risk in the first place. So we start with elimination controls, so, so things like remote consultation, identifying and excluding patients who have COVID so that they don't come into the area um, and isolating them, uh, engineering controls such as ventilations, screen barriers, and then administrative controls, things like um, facilitating social distancing between staff and patients and visitors, reconfiguring work systems, so ensuring that you try and do as much remotely. So particularly for allied health professionals, do they actually need to go into the ward? Can they look at patient records remotely and digitally? And then of course, the whole process of segregating positive patients so that we identify those who have the disease and we segregate them from those who don't. Those are all really critical controls and they are much more important um, as the first step in trying to protect staff and patients. Um, sorry, um, let me slip the slide. So just a quick word about social distancing. Um, and certainly in the first wave, I mean, things are better now. And I think people have got hold of this idea. But in the first wave, uh, there were many, many examples of a complete absence of social distancing amongst staff in the workplace gathering around um, central nursing stations, doing large ward rounds, gathering around the, the ward board with people standing very close to each other and not wearing any, any uh, face protection. 
So those things are all going to transmit infection in the workplace between, um, between the, the, the staff. And so systems need to be in place to ensure that that does not happen, that staff wear masks, they socially distance from each other as far as they possibly can in their working, um, in their working area. And where they can't socially distance, they are wearing masks. Canteens and food outlets present real problems because there generally aren't enough of them and it is very difficult for staff to take breaks in a socially distanced way and that you know is widely recognised as a problem but as far as possible we really need to socially distance to ensure that we minimise the risk of transmission between staff. And don't forget that outside work I think it's very hard for healthcare workers because they're dealing with staff, well, they're dealing with patients with Covid all the time. Um, and often it is difficult to socially distance at work, but actually many staff will acquire COVID in their home or their own social life. So it's really important that you don't bring COVID into the hospital by acquiring it outside. Obviously that can be very difficult depending on your home working conditions, but again, always keep in mind that the, those rules that apply to the population apply to healthcare workers just as much as anybody else. Um, I just want to make a point about healthcare associated transmission of COVID because again, um, PPE is about protecting the patient as well as staff. And you can see from this graph um, published by the Nuffield Trust that um, even I have to say in the first phase, there were a significant number of patients who came into hospital without COVID and left with it or if they were particularly unlucky because the mortality rate amongst patients who acquire COVID in hospital, as you can imagine, they are generally quite frail people if they're in hospital in the first place. So the chances are if they acquire COVID, they will not survive. Now our monitoring for hospital acquired COVID wasn't good in the first phase. And you can see from this graph that actually the monitoring is better and we are seeing around about somewhere between 20 and 30%, depending on the hospital of cases of COVID are acquired by patient in hospital. So we need to be really vigilant to ensure that the social distancing is working, so we minimize staff to staff transmission, that we recognize where patient to patient transmission may be a risk. Um, so being really vigilant in trying to pick up patients who may be developing symptoms and making sure they're isolated rapidly, um, being sure that um, shared equipment is properly decontaminated so the patients aren't using equipment and transmitting infection between each other and as far as possible trying to keep curtains closed and bed spaces distant so that patients don't have contact with each other and then of course adhering to best practice in term of, terms of IPC particularly around the use of gloves and hand hygiene to make sure that we're not picking up the viruses from surfaces or patients and then transferring it to another patient. So the infection control precautions um, differ slightly depending on whether we know the patient has COVID. And now that we have mass testing, um, obviously patients will acquire um, COVID once they're in hospital and sometimes they acquire it within their first few days. So they were incubating it. Um, so we need to have rigorous testing uh, systems in place to pick those up. But if the patient doesn't have COVID, then we can use standard precautions. I'm going to go through what that means. Um, if, they, if those patients undergo an aerosol generating procedure, there are precautions associated with doing an aerosol generating procedure anyway, um, but standard precautions can be used with some additional precautions where exposure to blood and body fluid is anticipated. If the patient has COVID or is suspected to have COVID or is being tested to see if they have COVID, then we use transmission-based precautions, droplet or contact precautions, and that involves the use of surgical masks for within two meters and then addition, additional level precautions for aerosol generating procedures and I'm just going to touch on all of those through the rest of the talk. I've put in the center there that because we are in a pandemic and uh, staff will be incubating COVID as well as other people in the environment that for all contact within two meters we need to uh, be wearing a fluid resistant surgical mask and to be honest I would also recommend a much greater use of uh, visors um, if, for no other reason that if you're wearing a visor, it helps stop you touching your eyes um, because you're protecting it with a, with a plastic um, uh, surface. Standard precautions um, tend to be, the word tends to be banded about with people not really knowing what it means. 
So it basically means you apply the standard of practice to the care of all patients. It involves uh, rules about hand hygiene, about the use of PPE, and about the safe management of the care environment. So that's cleaning, equipment decontamination, linen, linen, the management of blood and body fluids and waste. So i.e. these are basic principles of IPC that you have to apply in the care of everybody. Um, Uh, hand hygiene. So uh, you've probably seen those posters with those those orange arrows. That's the five moments of hand hygiene. And they basically mean that you must touch, you must wash your hands before you touch a patient. And that doesn't mean that you wash your hands and then you prepare a load of equipment and you pull the curtains around and then you see the patient. It means that you wash your hands after you've done all those things and immediately before you touch the patient before you do a clean or aseptic procedure, after touching a patient or their surroundings, and after removing your gloves, which is basically after you've put on gloves to do a procedure involving blood and body fluid, and then once you take the gloves off, you need to wash your hands. Alcohol gel is effective against COVID, and it's a very quick and easy way of decontaminating your hands, when there are often many points during a particular care episode when one of those moments occur. But if your hands get physically soiled, then you need to use soap and water. Uh, standard precautions in, includes gloves, but if you're uh, working with patients who don't have COVID, the only indication for using gloves is where you are using a procedure that involves direct contact with blood and body fluid. And then you as it risk assess the procedure and say, does this procedure involve me likely to have contact with blood and body fluid? If yes, then I wash my hands, I gather my equipment, I go to the patient, decontaminate my hands before I go come to the patient, and the point that I need to put the gloves on to have contact with body fluid, that's when I put the gloves on. Don't put the gloves on too early because you will simply touch a whole load of surfaces before you get to the patient, and by the time you get to the patient, those gloves will be contaminated. If you then don't take those gloves off uh, immediately, you will then contaminate a whole load of other surfaces before you eventually take them off. So don't touch shared equipment, shared surfaces with contaminated gloves on. Remove them immediately and decontaminate your hands. And don't forget that you may have gloves on, but if you touch your eyes or your mouth or your nose with those gloves, you will transfer whatever you've picked up onto your gloves onto those uh, mucous membranes. Aprons are the other component of PPE. So use those for a procedure where there's a risk that your clothing may become soiled or contaminated risk assess the procedure in the same way as gloves and put on immediately before you commence that procedure. And if it gets contaminated or when you leave the patient, you can take it off then, discard it and decontaminate your hands. So obviously when a patient has COVID or is suspected to have COVID, we need to use transmission-based precautions, so a higher level of precaution. And this would be relevant. So the droplet precautions are for patients that are for possible or confirmed COVID-19 or in a patient area where the patients are grouped together who all have possible confirmed COVID-19 or operating theatres where patients being operated on are possible or confirmed. And then airborne precautions, which are a higher level of precautions when you're conducting an aerosol generating procedure. I'll explain what those are on somebody with possible confirmed COVID. Um, and in high risk areas where AGPs are commonly performed, so ITU, um, accident emergency, resource areas, etc. So droplet precautions are based on the fact that the infection is transmitted by respiratory particles and contact with respiratory secretions. Now in a lovely ideal world when there's not a pandemic, we would put these patients in a single room and clearly that is not practical or feasible generally at the moment. So we tend to cohort them, put them together in a bay and it's really critical that the other patients in the bay are equally as likely to have COVID because what you really don't want to do is put a COVID patient in a bay with other patients who you have no reason to think they have COVID because that is a sure way to transmit infection between patients. Protective clothing then is recommended for close contact within two meters. So not like standard precautions where you just put the gloves and aprons on for a specific task with a specific patient. This is you are wearing close uh, pr protective clothing if you are within two meters of the patient. 
as well as for direct contact with body fluid. And then we need to try and keep those surfaces clean and where possible have dedicated patient equipment. So the PPE for droplet precautions, um, so the fluid resistant surgical mask, just to make sure that it's fitting properly. So you put it behind your ears. If you've got a small face, you might need to knot it so that it, it fits closely to your face and press the metal bar so that it adheres closely to your nose and try and uh, arrange it so that it's got as few gaps as possible. That will give you maximum protection for your mucous membranes. Um, and bear in mind that it also protects the patient because it prevents any uh, particles that you're expelling as you breathe or cough. You're preventing those from transferring to other people that you work with and to patients. So it's really important that it fits properly. Do not take it on and off. They are single use items and there are thousands of them. Throw it away and do bear in mind that when you touch your mask, it's going to be contaminated both with your particles and any of the particles that may have landed on it. So take it off by the hoops and discard it. Never wear it around your chin. Never hang it on one ear. Um, just simply throw it away and pick up another one when you need it. And always discard it if they get wet or uncomfortable or torn. Just pick up another one and put it on. And you, if you see other staff wearing masks inappropriately, please challenge them. Because wearing a mask like that is presenting additional risk to other people. They're contaminating their hands by touching the mask. And there is really no point in doing that. Just discard it and pick up another one. Eye protection I've mentioned, I think is useful to wear because it stops you touching your eyes. Gloves, um, you need to put on within two meters of the patient. But please remember that you have to apply those same principles of the five moments of hand hygiene. So you can't put on a pair of gloves and then do 300 tasks on the same patient because as soon as you go between a dirty and a clean task, actually you're transferring pathogens from the patient's soiled sheets directly into their IV site. So it's really essential that you see those gloves as they are there for a particular task. And if you contaminate them in any way before you do any sort of aseptic procedure, you must change those gloves and wash your hands. Same with the apron. You can carry on wearing the apron for care with that patient. But if it gets soiled in any way, you need to change it. And you discard all protective clothing, including the mask, get a new mask and put it on and clean your hands on leaving the room. So aerosol generating procedures, I know, cause a huge amount of concern. Um, and there is a lot of um, confusion about them. One of the reasons that I've talked more about aerosol generate aerosols is to try and illustrate to you that it is a complex situation. But just because aerosols are present doesn't make a procedure aerosol generating. And there is a specific de definition for aerosol generating procedures. In fact, their real name is high risk aerosol generating procedures. And they are defined by WHO as procedures that have been reported to be aerosol generating consistently associated with an increased risk of infection and transmission. Um, so this is the list on the side. Um, there is a link at the end of this talk um, because many of you um, may, may be um, concerned about recess. And there is a link for you there um, from NerveTag, which explains why that is not considered an AGP. And I've also added a link to the independent high risk AGP panel that has recently produced a report that really explains some of the principles underpinning why certain things may be AGPs and other procedures may generate aerosols but don't constitute an AGP. And you may find that helpful. Um, so if you're performing an AGP, actually, in reality, it's much better if it can be done in a, a single room and well ventilated room and the door closed. Again, we are in a situation where many patients with CPAP are managed in one room. If you can maintain good ventilation in the room, that's better. But I think the previous speaker illustrated really well that actually by putting a filter on the uh, airway, then actually the virus being emitted from the CPAP, it may look like it's producing virus because you can see the, the flow of air coming out of the tubing, but it's protected by the filter. So the virus is being captured by the filter and not being expelled in the air. Try and keep only essential staff in that room. Don't have people wandering in and out because you really do want to minimize the number of people exposed. Personal protective equipment for AGPs, 
So a high filtration, ideally an FFP3, but an FFP2 will do. Eye protection to protect those uh, mucous membranes. The guidance is a long sleeve waterproof gown. I'm going to come on to that in a minute and gloves. Um, remember with FFP3s, they, they have a much tighter fit, but they only will have that tight fit if you fit them properly to your face. So again, you have to get a good seal around the face um, and they should be fit tested. So you should have undergo a fit testing exercise before the procedure, before you start using these masks. You can wear them over a longer period of time, but you should discard them when you leave a particular area. And again, same principles apply. The mask will become contaminated on its surface, so be very careful to remove it with its straps and discard it and then decontaminate your hands. Um, the, I'm not going to go on at length about it, but the, there are various principles about leaving rooms vacant to allow aerosols to set, settle after procedures. Um, now, sessional use of PPE for uh, AGP areas has become commonplace in this pandemic, but I really want to highlight to you some of the risks associated with doing this. So the PPE guidance, um, which came out from PHE and still exists, was really adopted from Ebola. But remember with Ebola, extensive exposure to blood and body fluid is the major risk factor there. And therefore, the concept of covering yourself with a long sleeve gown and pulling the gloves up and covering the cuffs was really quite relevant. But in COVID-19, the risk is really these aerosols, respiratory particles that you inhale, and that's the way you're going to acquire the virus, or you're going to pick it up on your hands. But you can remove it from your hands with washing. And really, FFP3 is the main PPE requirement, and the gloves and gowns are secondary. Clearly, a gown is helpful because it reduces the, you'll pick up contamination as you work in the area, and it's easier to discard it with the gown. But sessional use encourages gowns and gloves to be donned on entry to the area and then not removed. And actually, by May 2020, there were many, many ICUs that were experiencing major outbreaks. An ICU that I worked in in central London, every single one of their patients got the same multi-drug resistant pathogen. And there is no doubt that that pathogen was transferred between patients on PPE used by the staff. So what, and you've all seen it, I've seen it, you see it on the TV all the time, staff put on two or three pairs of gloves. So they enter an area, pile on three or four pairs of gloves because they, they have this idea that, well, I can't really take all these gloves off. Um, I've got to keep, keep a pair of gloves on my hands. That is totally not necessary. The virus does not get through your skin. So um, sure, put your uh, FFP3 and your gown on before you go into the area but put the gloves on close to the patient's bedside and see them as single use item. Remember what I said about when you're caring for the patient, you need to change gloves between dirty and clean tasks. But what, was, what tends to happen if people wear them with sessional use is that they, they'll always leave a pair of gloves on. That means that they contaminate large numbers of shared uh, areas of equipment, desks, computers, phones, and that just presents a greater risk of transferring the virus around the whole area and transferring all sorts of other passion, pathogens like these multi-drug resistance as well. Um, so um, alcohol used to clean gloves, there is absolutely no evidence that works and we would never do it in other circumstances. So why do it now? Um, so just a quick run through of putting protective clothing on in this area. You put it on in this order, the gown, then you put the respirator on, it, you check that it fits closely around your mouth and the, the, tie, the uh, ear ties are working fine. Sorry. Um, put on the eye protection and then put the gloves on when at the patient best bedside. If possible, change the gown between patients or at a minimum, um, protect the gown with a plastic apron and change that between patients. And we've recently finished a, a study in Oxford using short sleeve gowns um, and washing hands and forearms between patients. And we use fluorescent dye to clearly demonstrate that the gowns transmit pathogens between patients on the sleeves. And that if you use short sleeves, but wash the hands and forearms between each patient, then that really reduces the risk of that happening. Um, but um, certainly with gloves, uh, put those on at the patient bedside and change them at regular intervals. 
removing protective clothing is actually one of the highest risk things that you do because you're wearing contaminated clothing and if you just rip it all off it's very easy to contaminate yourself in the process but it's simple to do it you just take the gloves off decontaminate your hands that's the most important thing then take your apron and gown off but take the ties off at the back and fold it up so that you're not touching the front contaminated area and finally take your mask and eye protection off and then de decontaminate your hands. Um, there are videos available and I've put a link to those from the Oxstar. And just to finish with, and I appreciate we're right at the end of time now, um, I know there's a lot of concern about staff acquisition of COVID. This is quite an interesting paper from David Ayer at Oxford and it does show there are some interesting data in here. Uh, this was about voluntary COVID testing, but it included both PCR or IgG. And between April and June 2020, 11% of these staff, there were thousands of them included in the study, were positive, which actually probably is about what you'd expect if you tested pretty much any population at that time. Um, the staff um, being confirmed with a household contact were the ones most likely to have COVID. So their odds, adjusted odds ratio was over four. There was a high rate of COVID-19 in staff working, working in COVID-facing area versus non-COVID-facing areas, but that risk wasn't as high as having a household contact. And this is really key. The highest risk was in porters and cleaners. So it's easy to think that actually being at the front line with COVID staff really puts us at such huge risk of, of, of COVID, but the porters and cleaners risk illustrates to us that actually there's a whole load of other risks going on there um, that influence why people end up with COVID and many of those relate to where, where you live. Um, the rates were higher in acute medicine um, than in ICU and again people often attribute that to this high level of PPE in ITU but do remember the patients in ITU are well progressed in their disease so many of them will no longer be shedding much virus yet the, there's less likely actually to be AGPs because uh, most patients are on mechanical ventilation. If you've got CPAP, fair enough, but we've already talked about the filtration. So actually, um, maybe one of the factors is that because staff do have PPE on, they're not touching their own mucous membrane so much because they're really well protected. So just to summarise, infection control for COVID-19 is not just about PPE. Um, you can acquire COVID-19 from your work colleagues and social contact, not just the patients. You must wear PPE properly at the recommended times if it's going to provide you protection. Touching your mouth, uh, uh, eyes, face, touching your mask with gloved or ungloved hands essentially increases your risk of transmission. And wash your hands after every task and think about what you do with them so that you avoid touching those dangerous mucous membranes. Thank you. Jamie, thank you so much for that presentation. It was um, excellent, really good, good summary. Again, um, some good questions coming up as well. Um, I see we are right on time at nine o'clock, so don't have very much time for a panel Q&A discussion this evening. But if I could ask um, the panelists to switch on their cameras, they are just, I, I was just going to, possibly ask one or two questions um, before we sign out for the evening, if that's okay. Um, so Chris, going back to your uh, presentation, um, there, there was a question in the chat which asked, is there any evidence for early versus delayed intubation in patients with COVID? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting question because I think in, in early on in the first wave, we were intubating patients early on the basis of data from, from, from China, um, which suggested that that was the only thing which would improve mortality with, with very poor outcomes for patients receiving non-invasive ventilation or CPAP. Um, and I think the evidence, there isn't good evidence to say that you can delay it, but what we are finding is that patients um, who, when they go on to ventilators, often don't, you can't, you aren't able then to reduce pressures down. So actually what we're finding is that by how we, we are able to hold patients with CPAP for a period of time, which at the very least is able to offset um, the pressures on ICUs for numbers of patients needing intubation. So I think we've moved away from the idea that people need to be intubated early. 
So it's not saying that there's direct evidence of early versus late, but certainly we're, we're not as we were in the very early stages, intubating people at a very early stage. Thank you, that's, that's really helpful. Um, also just um, carrying on, um, in your presentation, you had a summary slide um, with regards to venturi and then escalating to um, other levels of respiratory support. Can you clarify when you would um, increase someone from venturi to, for example, CPAP or uh, high flow oxygen? So I think in, in, in Oxford, we have a threshold that people who are on 40% oxygen or eight litres of oxygen, we would want to know about them because at that stage we're going to start thinking about moving them onto CPAP. That's not to say that we can take everyone who's on 40% Venturi because there's a massive demand, but we will look at the trajectory of that patient and if they're on a rapidly accelerating patient we will try and take them to provide them with CPAP at that stage because we want to try and get them in an early stage so we can get them established and comfortable with CPAP which can be quite claustrophobic and obviously quite frightening for patients before they get to a stage where they're in extremis. So, so that's, that would be our ideal, we'll be taking them around that stage if they're on a 40 or 60% venturi or on eight litres of oxygen. Practically, we can't do that for everybody, but we would want to know about those patients, certainly in Oxford. And I think that would probably be similar in most hospitals. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, Andrew, if I can ask you, there was quite a few questions um, that came um, out regarding routine admission blood tests um, in patients with COVID. Um, are you happy to go into a little bit more detail about that, um, especially with regards to tests like D-dimers, troponin, LDH, um, that sort of thing for patients? And are there any considerations for interpreting those results in patients with COVID? That's a great question, yes. Um, so we certainly, we, we tend to do quite a, a broad panel of investigations as part of this care set when patients come in the front door. And usually it's the routine bloods that I think are most helpful. Has the patient got a lymphopenia? Have they got a lot of neutrophils in their blood? And um, what's the renal function like? That's probably more valuable. The D-dimer though, although I mentioned it does tend to be elevated in a lot of COVID patients, I suppose the height of that elevation can sometimes perhaps prompt us towards doing CTPAs earlier, for example, if we're worried about PE. And troponin, potentially, again, just considering a wider differential, could there be a degree of myocarditis in this presentation? That's why we would do that. As for things like LDH and ferritin, that just tends to go up with more of a pro-inflammatory response that's just giving you an idea of that's what stage of illness the patient's at. But for, lot, for many of these, we don't really have good guidelines on how to interpret them. I think really the D-dimer is probably the one that I look at more often and then the full blood count. But the interpretation is challenging. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and then Jenny, if I could ask you um, a question that's come up. Um, we have seen that there have been higher rates of nosocomial infections um, in red bays um, where patients are nursed, even in bays where they're two meters apart and they're wearing surgical masks. Is there an argument um, for wearing FFP3 masks in red areas um, like we would do in intensive care environments where there have been notably fewer cases of nosocomial infections? Um, clearly, with the new variant, um, data needs to be kept un under review, and I, I would acknowledge that. But um, the general, and I, I, I cannot believe that, well, I guess most of you haven't worked in practice for a while, but when you do go into practice, you will see countless examples of poor use of PPE, people not wearing it properly, not wearing it consistently, not changing gloves, um, touching lots of surfaces with gloves. And therefore, thinking that upping the level of, of, um, of mask is going to prevent transmission, I think is a little bit simplistic because we know it transmits by all these other routes as well. Um, if we could be confident that PPE was applied perfectly and infection control precautions as I've outlined them were applied perfectly and we were still seeing transmission, then that might suggest that that is required. But I think what I've tried to illustrate you from uh, with the aerosols that it still remains that the droplets present the greatest risk, not the aerosols, because that is where most of the virus is being generated. Um, 
I do think patients present a problem, particularly as many of them will be confused if they're in hospital. It's, you know, nowadays these people will be ill and it can be quite difficult to prevent them wondering and it can be quite difficult to, to encourage them to wear a mask, especially if they're poorly. Um, but there is, no, uh, there is no indication that adding that FFP3 is going to make a difference. And as I illustrated about, yes, yeah, sure, there is evidence that there's lower acquisition rates in ITU. But as I illustrated, there's many reasons why that might be the case. And I don't think we've, we, it's circumstantial evidence that the rates of acquisition in, are lower in, in ITU and, and, and the assumption that that's related to PPE, but there may be lots of other reasons that explain it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I am very aware that we are now running over time, so I think it's probably a good time to um, tie up for the evening. Um, do, does anyone on the panel have any sort of closing remarks or anything that you've picked up in the questions or the chat that you'd like to comment on? Perfect. Um, so then I just want to really end by saying thank you so much to Jenny, Chris, Gareth and Andrew um, for putting together the presentations at Extremely Late Notice. They were all fantastic presentations and it was really great to have your um, input on the panel tonight. So thank you very, very much. And thank you also to all the audience members for giving up uh, your Friday evening. We hope that you found um, the webinar to be really um, helpful and informative. And um, as we mentioned, the recording will be available on the HE website. Um, please do fill in the feedback link at the end of this um, survey. If you are a, a returning trainee, um, please do contact your local supported return to training office to find out what's available on offer in your region. Um, wishing everybody all the very best of luck um, as you are redeployed to COVID wards and um, as we face this pandemic together. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>